Hello everyone, my name is Steve. I run Vorsprung Suspension up in Whistle BC and this is another episode of Tuesday Tune. This will be the first one that we've done in quite a while, uh, since last winter actually. Filming with a GoPro on a selfie stick, which I absolutely love because social distancing is a responsible thing to do right now. What I wanted to talk to you about today uh, is the concept of grip. So grip is something that gets talked about a lot with regard to suspension setup. And I wanted to go through a couple of concepts that will hopefully help us understand how our suspension plays that part, what the relevant aspects of the suspension are in terms of setup and performance, uh, and what other factors play into that as well. So it's not just suspension that determines your grip. Obviously there's tires, there's geometry, there is the rider's behavior and body position. There's a whole lot of different factors at play there. So we're gonna delve into a few of those and see what we can reveal. So this section of trail that I'm on uh, has one very good corner for illustrating a couple of concepts here. Uh, what I'm going to talk about, what we'll call steady state grip, so that's grip where things aren't changing rapidly, uh, if at all, ideally, and dynamic grip. So dynamic grip is essentially measured by the variation in contact patch load. So when we say contact patch, what we're talking about is this bit right here, where this is contacting the ground, how much that load is varied vertically uh, determines essentially how much dynamic grip we have. When we're talking about steady state grip, however, what that is typically referring to is our ability to keep weight on that wheel. So not just how much is varying, but how much weight is on there in the first place. The best way to really look at steady state grip is to consider the relationship between the front and the rear. And so we have a certain amount of weight and that is basically on a bicycle. We don't have aero downforce or anything like that. We have a certain amount of weight uh, and how that's distributed between the front and the rear really determines how much grip either of those tires has at the time. The more weight on the tire, the more grip that that tire has, but the less the other one has. And so that's really critical to understand uh, from a rider's point of view more than anything, uh, to make sure that you have grip on the right tire at the right time when you need it. We're gonna have a quick dig into this corner here and have a look at where we'd be concerned about dynamic grip. So that transient load on the, on the tires and where we'd be more concerned about steady state grip static grip it's not static obviously so where we are here is a fairly smooth entry into a corner there are as we lean down and as you can see here some small steps that will be rolling over now these are only 15 centimeters six inches or so high maybe a little more they're enough that if you don't have enough uh sag available on those bumps they are enough that the wheel can leave the ground unless we're pushing it down into it. So this is one very small area where dynamic grip would come into play. So that is essentially something that your suspension predominantly has to keep the wheel on the ground in order that you have grip. Obviously the rougher it gets, the more of this there is. If you're running into these roots and rocks constantly, then the dynamic grip becomes a really big concern. So then we have the remainder of the corner, which is actually quite smooth until we get to some of these rocks at the exit, and even then fairly smooth beyond that. So most of this corner is going to be not entirely steady state because your weight will shift on the bike. Start, you know, coming in early, you'll be braking. And then as you release the brakes uh, towards the apex of the corner, then that will release some of the load on the front tire. As a result, the way that you control your body position has a huge impact on how much load there is vertically on any tire at any given time. That means that your body position at that time and the geometry of the bike play a huge role in keeping enough grip through that steady state part of this corner. So this is the kind of thing where you can kind of test it in a gravel parking lot or something like that. Simply turning tighter and tighter at a, at a fixed speed down a, down a gravel hill, something like that is not a bad way to test it. You can vary your body position backwards and forwards and you'll find that at some point if your body weight is far enough forwards, the back wheel will start sliding. This is how you rip a cutty. And likewise, you go the other way, you have your weight too far back and the front wheel will start pushing. The same thing applies on the trail um, and that's why it's really critical that we keep enough weight on the front wheel uh, for cornering purposes. And when you watch like the top riders in the world, if you watch Sam Hill, Richie Rude, Loic Bruni, Danny Hart, any of these guys that are really tearing corners apart, you see them appear to be very aggressive and over the front. And the reason for that isn't just that they're trying to snap the handlebars off the bike. Maybe they are, I don't think they are. But the reason for that is that essentially being in that position is what is really giving them good control of the bike, but even more so, enough weight on the front tire that the front wheel doesn't wash out. And that allows them to commit very, very hard to corners, much harder than the rest of us really want to because you know when it does go wrong and it goes wrong pretty badly but body position is the the major part of that uh and that is riding ability you know your ability to judge where your body should be and put it in that place at that time what i'm going to dig into on the whiteboard next is essentially the aspects of geometry and suspension setup that have the biggest effect on that uh, steady state grip so how much vertical load you have on either tire at any given moment the, and secondly the aspects of suspension setup that really affect the dynamic grip so again the dynamic grip being essentially your 
suspension's ability and a rider's ability to a lesser extent to keep the wheels on the ground and to keep that contact patch load as consistent as possible. We'll look at some ways that that's typically analyzed. Not very useful for the purposes of setup unless you really have a lot of time to crunch numbers, but we'll look at some of the ways that that can be analyzed and hopefully give you a better understanding of the dynamics of keeping a wheel on the ground. And so this will also tie in quite a lot with some of the stuff we've discussed in the past about harshness, uh, harshness and bump compliance in particular. Uh, the two are not unrelated. Better compliance typically means your tire is kept on the ground more uh, with less variation in contact patch load. And that can then sometimes lead to other compromises in performance, particularly if the setup isn't stiff enough uh, in circumstances where we're seeing really big movements of the suspension and really big movements of the rider's center of mass. In those scenarios, then we can find that overly soft, overly compliant suspension can compromise things in other ways. That isn't something that we're actually gonna get into in this video in any great depth, because that is essentially a never ending bottomless pit. Uh, and without you know spending months here setting things up with our data logger, we're not gonna get a meaningful result or process to show you guys on that. All right, so we're back at the uh, vaunted whiteboard to discuss um, something approximating steady state grip. So to understand the background of this, we need to understand that on you know what we can consider flat, smooth ground. When I say flat, I mean smooth, radiant, not changing. If we're coasting and we're not braking, then we have a fixed weight distribution. And so this graph shows uh, vertical contact patch load on each tire. So the red is the front tire, so that starts off lower than the rear tire. And the reason for that obviously is that bikes have a real weight, weight bias. More of your weight is on the back than the front when you're standing on it in a you know fairly neutral position. So front tire starts with a lower load than the rear tire. The sum is this green line up there. When we're coasting along, we're not changing anything. Those proportions remain intact. Now these are not exactly representative of reality. You know, I've just broken this down into neat thirds because it's, it's something vaguely similar to that. It isn't actually that. This is only for the sake of illustration. So say we're coasting, we come to a corner, we brake hard into the corner. What that does is it rotates the whole bike forward, tips all our weight onto the front tire. That means that the front tire load increases significantly while we're braking, rear tire load decreases significantly. What this means, we have less sag in the rear suspension, more sag in the front suspension under this dynamic condition. So this is only happening while we're decelerating. And you know, when I say decelerating, that can be maintaining a certain speed on a gradient, right? So if you're on steep enough ground, you can be braking very hard. You'll maintain a constant speed because gravity is opposing the force you're braking. Regardless, unless you're pushing your weight back, you'll shift a lot of weight onto the front tire. Even if you are shifting your weight back, you'll push a lot of weight onto the front tire. And so what we see then is that the front tire becomes a massive fraction of the total the total load on the tires. So this total load, as you'll see in this graph, remains about constant until we hit something that dynamically accelerates the center of mass upwards or downwards. Again, we're looking at smooth ground here. So breaking into the corner, the rear wheel vertical contact patch load drops right off. That means we have less grip from the, top, from the rear tire. You have less compression of the rear suspension at that point, which means there's less travel available for it to drop into holes and whatnot. Conversely, the front has dived, it's under more load, there's more available travel, uh, negative travel, I should say, for it to, to follow the ground. And I'll illustrate this in a second with a video that I recorded, basically to show what, what that really means over a single bump leading into a corner while we're braking. As we release the brakes, again, assuming here that this is a flat corner, not a berm, that means that the total load on the tires stays the same. So we're arcing a nice big turn on smooth ground without the ability to create additional vertical force through a berm or similar, or through a G out. So what that means is as we release the brakes towards the entry of the turn, the load starts to transfer more to the rear tire. So the rear tire load is increasing, Front tire load is decreasing, but it's still quite a bit higher than the rear as we're releasing the brakes. In this, you know, ideal world, we do fairly smoothly. We don't just dump the brakes in order that things are happening in a manner that is predictable, basically. So we're not upsetting the geometry of the bike uh, and the load on the tires too sudden. At some point we reach this approximately steady state area. So this is the middle of the corner. And this is where we're adjusting our weight balance so that, you know, initially we'll ideally have a bit more grip on the front tire for safety. You know, the closer we get to the limit of how hard we're riding, the, the closer that balance has to be. So, you know, the, 
the top riders in the world are able to push the front tire very, very close to the limit while maintaining enough grip on that, that you know the it's not washing out on them and dumping them on their heads. A lot of advanced riders who are not quite at that like top five in the world level, which is a lot of riders, will play it a bit safer and keep it a bit more weight on the front tire. That means that, you know, if anything's gonna slide, basically it's the rear. That's the, that's the safe hope, because the rear slides out, you know, we, we know how to deal with that. Front washes out, there's not necessarily a lot you can do. Sometimes you save it, sometimes you go down. So what we're seeing in this middle part of the corner here is that things aren't changing rapidly or very much. So this is what I was talking about with steady state load on the tire, and steady state grip. And so if we were to, for example, lift this red curve up a little bit, so we were to lift that up to there, which would necessitate that we also lower this blue one bit to here, the time being, in this middle part. That is something that we can do to control exactly how much grip that we have on the front wheel, the rear wheel, at any given time. More grip on the front wheel, again, rear wheel let go first. More grip on the rear wheel, front wheel let's go first. Now this is affected predominantly by body position, but the second biggest factor affecting this is bike's geometry. If you want to go back to one of our previous videos on understanding advanced bike geometry, I think it was called, the second part of that where we discussed the front center and rear center ratios of the bike, we go into a lot of like how body position affects that steady state contact patch load on the tires, uh, how the geometry of the bike affects it, how the rider's position interacts with the geometry. As we come to the exit of the corner, we should revert to something like uh, the coasting situation. Typically, in reality, we'll actually exceed the load somewhat on the rear tire it is what is essentially stopping us from continuing to rotate because when this is a bit of an aside when a vehicle turns a corner it has two accelerations that it needs to undergo to begin turning the corner and one that it needs to undergo to exit the corner so when it starts turning the corner we have to rotate the vehicle so you need a certain amount of load of the tires uh, to begin the rotation of the vehicle and that's why on a mountain bike we have the ability to change the major part of the mass by rotating our center of mass before we get to the corner so we can actually get the rotation begun at the very least uh, with the heaviest part of the vehicle which is the rider. The second part of that is that in addition once we've got the thing rotating at the right speed then we need to actually accelerate it laterally and so that's accelerating towards the inside of the corner. Now that acceleration drops off uh, once the radius of the corner disappears but it doesn't ever have to go back the other way. We're never reversing the, the velocity. The rotation however does have to be stopped so you, we have a certain amount of rotational momentum of the vehicle. So as it's rotating, let's say counterclockwise in this case, you have to accelerate it to get it up to a certain rotational velocity, then decelerate it to keep it pointed in a certain direction. And that is why we'll see that the rear tire will actually have to have a bit more load on it, right? assuming again that we're operating at sort of maximum performance conditions here, in order to stop the continued rotation of the bike around the sort of the vertical axis. Um, a lot of people for years have kind of discussed, okay, if it is uh, faster for your tires to be gripping and not slipping, why do rally cars drift? Two answers to that. First of all, the coefficients of friction that apply on tarmac don't necessarily apply on dirt, but the bigger one is simply that they separate that rotation of the vehicle. So they start the car rotating before the corner, and then they've got the full grip available from all four wheels to deal with the lateral acceleration that is actually pulling the car sideways throughout the corner. There's a whole lot of other control dynamics with that as well. The steering geometry, the ability to use the throttle to change uh, the yaw and to also change the rate of acceleration towards the inside of the corner. They're big things with rally car driving. I don't pretend to be an expert on that. and It's not directly relevant to mountain bikes, but as an interesting aside, that is the same theory that we're looking at with mountain bikes. Where we want to separate the, uh, the rotation from the lateral acceleration to some degree. So next, and the second part of this video, uh, I'm going to talk about dynamic contact patch load. Um, something that I discussed trail side. I really want to just give you guys some idea of the concept of that uh, dynamic contact patch load. As far as what we do exactly with setup, tuning and things like that to maximize that, if anyone has successfully quantified this, I'd be very surprised. It's not something that we have fully quantified because it is an incredible number of variables in this equation. What that means, we haven't quantified a way to say, follow this procedure A, B, and C, and this will ensure that we are minimizing the dynamic contact patch load variation. What we're really looking for when we're trying to optimize dynamic contact patch load is minimizing the variation. I'll illustrate some concepts with that, what we're trying to achieve, so that hopefully you can understand that. It's a little bit esoteric, uh, a little bit abstract, 
Hopefully it's something that you can understand to some degree and apply that when we're tuning our suspension in situations that involve compromise between multiple facets. For example, balancing rebound being slow enough to be stable with fast enough to track ground. Yeah, hopefully just give you guys something interesting to think about uh, next time you're out on the trail.